now we will begin with the second session titled The Future of Iraq, Iraq Conflict Zone or Bridge Builder. As such, I would like to introduce to you and welcome the chair and speakers on the stage. This session will be chaired by Dr. Dakota Wood of the Heritage Foundation. Our speakers are Dr. Muhammad Radi, Senior Advisor to Sayyid Ahmad Al-Hakim, Dr. Ken Pollack, Resident Scholar of the American Enterprise Institute, Dr. Osman Seret of Ankara Institute, Dr. Irina, Russian Academy of Sciences Institute of Oriental Sciences, Science, uh, Oriental Studies, excuse me, Dr. Muhammad Ali Shabani, Center for Strategic Research in Tehran. Now we shall begin. Good. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, it's a great honor. Uh, Your Excellencies, ambassadors, distinguished guests, uh, what a terrific panel we have here. Uh, I'm very humbled to help facilitate the conversation. And what I'm really striving for is for us to actually have a discussion. So instead of berating you with lectures, uh, we're going to share some very brief comments from the external actor perspective in large measure, uh, have a conversation, and then open it up to uh, hopefully dynamic participation with the audience. So the guidelines that we were given was to think about this region uh, as uh, in both its hazards and its promise, right, the risks and opportunities. Uh, and that if there was, uh, let's say, a conflict between the United States and Iran, which has had tensions for many, many years, and it took place on the landscape of Iraq, uh, clearly Iraq is involved with that. And Washington is going to have to uh, deal with Baghdad as well as other capitals. Uh, the U.S. withdrawal from Syria has certainly had implications and consequences for the Kurdish region and for uh, Iraq at large. What are those implications? And then finally, what role does Iraq have as either a facilitator or a mediator in trying to resolve some of these tensions that have really uh, beleaguered the, the region for a very long time. So those are kind of the major themes or the catalysts, uh, both in the present, I think Ken will probably point out, as well as the uh, future. And we want to have a discussion about that. So what I've asked each one of our panelists to do is to provide very brief comments that, that hopefully uh, convey their country's perspective on some of these issues and then their own individual perspective. Do they agree or disagree? Do they have a comment to make about some of those things? And, and in, the, in the, the, uh, the sequence we're going to do, we'll take the Iraqi perspective first. We'll follow that with an Iranian perspective, then go to the Turkish point of view, uh, Russian commentary, and then we will end up with the US uh, comment uh, there at the end. And after we have these, hopefully again, five minutes or so each, uh, we'll go into a conversation. I'll try to facilitate with some questions. Uh, but would each one of the panelists have a comment on something that the other has said, please do that. And don't wait for me to, to try to draw that out. And so we'll do that for a bit and then uh, really engage with the audience. So uh, with that as kind of the preface, if we could start with uh, the Iraqi perspective, please. Thank you, Dakota. Uh, you know, Iraq geopolitically is uh, among uh, a huge uh, uh, countries like that have uh, regional and international uh, agendas. So for a long time, Iraq was uh, a place where those agen agendas struggling. And unfortunately, the internal situation of Iraq, the internal uh, uh, disagree uh, inside Iraq uh, since a long ago uh, helped this uh, struggle to be more uh, 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 effective, more, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, help others to be more engaging in, inside Iraq. After 2003, uh, the balance uh, uh, was violated uh, uh, in the, to the benefit of the United States. The United States was in Iraq. Uh, all the um, troops and uh, uh, they uh, changed this, the system and changed the, the uh, um, framework, the structure of Iraqi uh, state. So the Iranian felt that this balance this time uh, is against them. So they tried to change this uh, situation to their benefit. What happened in 
2008 till 2011 when the United States withdrew from uh, Iraq, the balance became in the benefit of Iran. So uh, this struggle uh, uh, reached the, the, the moment that the Iranian now looked widely that Iran, the Iranian are dominating uh, Iraq. So uh, uh, now um, the United States, others are trying to restore uh, this uh, balance. Um, Iraq, uh, um, you know, this is, this is what the agendas want. But inside Iraq also, unfortunately, we couldn't uh, build the strong state. When I, and when I'm, I'm saying the strong state, I'm, I mean the state that able to gather their, uh, um, its people and to uh, be more effective, uh, not strong as a dictatorship. But uh, this situation also made Iraq more in mess, so others uh, uh, continue to uh, uh, conflict on our uh, territory. Uh, yeah, it is. I mean, if you don't have your own house in order, yeah, sure. people can exploit this opportunistically for their own ends, mm -hmm. right? Uh, very complicated. From the Iranian perspective? Well, I think, uh, Iran has always seen uh, Iraq as vital to its security. It's not anything new, but I think what's, what's changed recently is that there's been an added dimension to that. I think because of U.S. sanctions designed to force Iran out of the region, it has become more reliant on Iraq, not just for its security, but also for its economy. And hence, it's become more entrenched. I think this is a vital dimension to consider when looking at Iranian policy uh, in the region, specifically Iraq. Beyond that, I think that Iraq has not just been a major battleground between Iran and the U.S. in the past 15 years. Uh, it has also been uh, a scene for negotiation. The first negotiation between Iran and the U.S. since 1979 was not about the nuclear issue. It was about Iraq, and it happened in the office of the Prime Minister Nouri Maliki at the time, 2007. And this is important to consider as well, I think. Now, there's an added dimension to all of this as well, which I think yesterday uh, Deputy Prime Minister Talibani was talking about. He said about the vision that Iraq has for itself. And the fundamental question here is, does Iraq want to return to be a gate, or does it want to be a bridge? And this is a conversation for Iraqis to have themselves. And Iran, I don't think, can have much of a role in that. Um, in terms of present politics, I think the Prime Minister Abdel Mahdi has played a vital role in repairing relations with uh, GCC countries and also Kurdistan region. And Iran's reaction to these initiatives has shown that it's open to it and it supports it. Iran wants Iraq or Baghdad to have good relations with Arabia. It wants Baghdad to have balanced relations with Saudi Arabia, with UAE. I think, unfortunately, the sense right now is that uh, the Iran inside, I think, feels that Saudi Arabia and Israel and U.S., they don't have an Iraq policy anymore, not under this administration. There's an Iraq parenthesis under their Iran policy, but there's no Iraq policy. And I think until they forge a unitary Iraq policy, until there is more unity within Iraq, I see it as very difficult to engage proactively with the U.S. on the Iraq fight. On uh, the Turkish uh, standpoint here, I mean, clearly it's a major player in the region, so uh, has equities in how it's dealing with, uh, with its Kurdish issues uh, that stretch back many, many years. Thank you, thank you Dakota, for the uh, meeting, and thank you for the American University of Kurdistan and the Iraqi Kurdistan regional government for this excellent meeting. Uh, it is a bit ironic that we are talking about whether Iraq will be a bridge builder when the bridges in Baghdad was uh, closed by the protesters right now. And that's why we are trying to think about whether Iraq will be a bridge builder. First of all, Iraq should build bridges among its you know, segments, between Sunnis, among Sunnis, between Shias, among Shias, between Kurds and Turkomans and others. And that's why it is not easy that just to, to, to predict that Iraq will be a bridge builder in the coming near future. Regarding the Turkish perspective, I remember whether when Mr. Uh, Alavi was in Ankara, I have asked that maybe 10 years ago, uh, what is your you know, um, perception of Turkey and recommendation to Turkey? Just he said that, look, uh, guys, you are, as the Turks, just closing your eyes with your hands, and you are seeing the Turkomans within your fingers. You are just opening up it a bit, and you are seeing Kurds. And then you are a bit opening up and seeing Sunnis. Why you don't release your hands and seeing the Iraq as it is? And if the Turkey will be a part of the bridge, and Turkey should see the Iraq as it is. But the problem is that now Turkey is a bit rolling back, especially with the, uh, Mr. Maliki being the, the, the prime minister of uh, Iraq. 
And then the, what's happening in Syria, which is supported by Iran, and the development of negative feelers regarding the Shia dominance in the region. And Turkey first just exclude the Shias from, the, the, from its perspective in Iraq. And then, uh, since Sunnis were just excluded from the picture when Mr. Maliki was uh, here, and then with 20, the 15th of July, coup attempt the securitization of all political perception of Turkey and the President Erdogan as well. And then the killing of the peace process in Turkey. And then the referendum issue. The Kurds, again, just a bit excluded from the picture. And Turkey is just going back to the square one. And that's why we need time first. Uh, and uh, for the bridge builder, for the coming prospectors, I want to make a differentiation between Baghdad and Erbil. For instance, now we are in Erbil from very different you know, perspective, very different backgrounds. We are coming here and we are discussing the region, but I don't think that Baghdad is able and ready to play such kind of a role right now. And that's why, but if Erbil waits for Baghdad to play such a role, it will be you know, uh, uh, late for Erbil. And that's why it is very difficult to, to match Erbil and Baghdad's pace on being a bridge builder. If Iraq can, able and capable to create an harmony, which I've seen that at the previous panel it won't be so easy, uh, yes, it can play such a role. But unless uh, it happens, I think the, the Iraq will continue to be a conflict and uh, co uh, conflict zone in the coming future. From the Russian perspective, I mean, it was gone from the region for quite a while. Uh, back is a very important uh, player, uh, also could be a facilitator and a reconciler. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to start with thanks to the organizers of this wonderful event. And I'm really honored to be here. Uh, well, I agree with what has already been said by my colleagues here, because for Iraq to become a mediator, uh, it needs to stabilize the situation inside, first and foremost. As for um, an ability of being mediator, if the situation is stabilized, I believe that Iraq is a very good candidate since it uh, has developed very close ties with various actors in the Middle East. And now, when there is so much talk about possible wars and clashes uh, in Persian Gulf and other areas, I believe that Iraq, with its ties, and uh, I would say even with uh, its friendly uh, relationship with some countries, of course, would have been the best candidate as a mediator to prevent the developments going from bad to worse. But uh, here, uh, I can only say that for Russia, what's going in Iraq is very, she, Russia is very sensitive to what's going in Iraq because, as you know, she is present in Syria right now. So we do believe that stability in Iraq, nationwide dialogue will help to, to, to not only to make the situation in Iraq safer, but also in Syria and in other areas of the Middle East. So stability in Iraq actually spreads to yeah. a larger regional Absolutely. Uh, stability. Yeah. United States, where are you guys at? First of all, uh, Dakota, <laughs> I want to be very clear in saying I do not speak for the Trump administration. Uh, I, uh, I will make that to, effort here in just a bit. Uh, I, I'm going to try to interpret what they're doing, but that's about the best I can do. And first, I, w I also want to start by saying that I actually completely agree with Mohammed in his characterization that I don't think that the, this government really has a well-formed Iraq policy. Um, I have no doubt that Ambassador Tuller could stand up here and speak for an hour on what U.S. policy toward Iraq is. But in terms of actually a coherent idea about what the United States wants to see from Iraq, I don't believe it exists. I think Mohammed is absolutely right that this administration has an Iran policy, and Iraq is at best an occasional subset of its Iran policy. Now, I think the good news is that if Iraq wanted to play some kind of a mediating, or try to play, I should put it that way, because it's going to be very difficult, but if Iraq wanted to play some kind of a mediating role between the United States and Iran, I suspect that the administration might be willing to listen to that. It would be very wary. There is a strong perception in the Trump administration that Baghdad is dominated by Tehran, so they would look at it as Iran's proxies coming to them. But nevertheless, 
President Trump seems to be heavily invested in the idea of negotiations with Iran, I think they'd be interested in that kind of a thing. I also think that President Trump has made it very clear he's not looking for a war with Iran in terms of actual military combat. He's not looking to develop military operations against Iran from Iraq in Iraq or anywhere else. So I think that that's probably good news from Iraq's perspective. The problem really, though, is that there is this overwhelming neglect from the United States. Iraq has all kinds of problems, as the President pointed out, as Prime Minister has pointed out, as our first panel pointed out. It desperately needs American assistance. And of course, that has been in short supply. And from my perspective, the real heart of the matter here is what could change and could the dynamics between the United States and Iran change in some way to force a shift in American policy toward Iraq so that the United States became more interested in investing in Iraq, in helping Iraq sort out its problems, and mostly in putting resources into Iraq to help it to deal with its problems. I, I will start by saying I think that, that is going to be very, very difficult. This president has no interest in doing so. And you know, I think one of the most important things to think about there is that you know, if you look at President Trump's Iran policy on its face, just take it on its own terms, that it's supposed to be about opposing maximum economic pressure on Iran. Well, if that's your goal, then developing a strong, stable, vibrant Iraq would actually be a critical element of that policy. Because you'd want to make sure that Iraq was strong enough to push back on Iran, that Iran couldn't use the Iraqi economy for currency manipulation and smuggling. Right, this all should be part and parcel of what the United States is doing right now toward Iran. And we're not, as you've all noticed. So again, it suggests that it's going to be difficult to get President Trump there. What could do it? Well, obviously, if there were an international, transnational terrorist group operating from Iraqi soil, I think that would focus his attention. If there were a sudden drop in Iraqi oil production, I think that would focus his attention. But obviously, the most important thing of all, the thing that really could kind of light the powder keg between Iran and the United States and embroil Iraq is if there were Iranian-backed groups in Iraq that began to attack Americans in Iraq. Right? That's the thing which could clearly focus President Trump here. And I think that you could see him both mount attacks against Iran directly or mount attacks against Iranian interests here in Iraq. That's how you could get to a scenario where Iraq becomes a battleground between the US and Iran. Yeah, there's, um, I I would assume uh, folks in the room have heard this stated in one way or another that all politics are local. So when we try to interpret U.S. policy, for example, or perhaps Russian or Turkish, uh, as it relates to foreign engagements, foreign relationships, it, we cannot ignore what's going on back at home. So for President Trump, he came into office, I think, as a huge rejection of the establishment in Washington, D.C., the policy elites, the academics, these sorts of things. I mean, his constituency was, we don't like that. You're the antithesis of that. Therefore, we love you. And so as we go into a U.S. presidential election cycle, uh, he campaigned originally on getting us out of these long-running contests, these, these points of friction. There don't seem to be any uh, good exits uh, in terms of resolving problems and moving on to you know, a much better uh, life in these areas. And so from a domestic standpoint, I think that's really what shapes a lot of his views and how he approaches. I presume it's the same thing in the other countries as well, you know, that whoever the national leader is is having to account for what's going on back home and the inter-party feuds, uh, the various dynamics that are in different regions across the country, we certainly have that in the United States as well. And so I don't know that, that this kind of discussion about how domestic policy affects how countries engage in foreign policy sorts of things really informs these kinds of debates. So whether it's, you know, uh, 
peace in the Levant, peace in the Middle East, the Palestinians versus the Israelis, the Japanese versus the South Koreans. I mean, the United States is a global power and has global interests, is having to account for all of these things. And so when somebody like a Donald Trump looks at the issue here in Iraq or what's going on in Syria or Iran, the last thing he is wanting to do is to recommit and keep committing the United States to these very difficult situations that just seem to suck up billions of dollars and however many U.S. lives. I mean, that's my interpretation. And I think it's important to note that none of us here on the panel are you know, members of office or an administration. It's our interpretation of what's going on and sharing some insight drawn from years of kind of looking at these things. So, I mean, any comments about this, this kind of local versus international? Yeah, uh, I want to say that, as you say, the domestic uh, um, principles, factors, are affecting the level of, of engaging mm -hmm. uh, outside. Uh, and when we see that for Iran, Iraq is the first priority in its uh, national security. <laughs> while uh, what is Iraq in the, in the, in the uh, uh, national security uh, uh, strategy for the United States, especially after 2003. Uh, this is mainly what we suffer from when we talk with the Americans, that they see Iraq as a very small piece uh, in complicated area, in uh, a difficult world. They, uh, they don't want to be more engaged. In, uh, in Iraq. That's why there is this kind of uh, different engagement in, in Iraq. For Iraq also, the domestic uh, um, uh, situation uh, affected the credibility of, of Iraq to play any role, like being a, a, medi a mediator. Uh, we need to increase our credibility by controlling our territory, by controlling all the actors playing on our uh, uh, territory by restoring the uh, satisfaction of our people uh, 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 regarding the political uh, system. Uh, when we have those uh, uh, elements, we can maybe at the first uh, stage to be uh, a place where, where the Iranian the, and the American can sit and uh, start a kind of a negotiation, but not even not a medi mediator. Maybe we need years to play this year. So this, my, you're all, sorry. My, you know, my background has been a military career, right? So I'm not deeply expert in the local, uh, more regional aspects. I deployed in many parts of the world, and so I have a different perspective. So when I think about the things that you just said, then I think about our Iranian colleague, that perspective, Russian perspective, Turkish perspective, uh, as, as an observer, um, I see these uh, you know, Shia versus Sunni tensions that have been going on for 1,400 years, uh, probably not going to be resolved this weekend. Uh, you know, the, uh, the nation state sorts of conflicts, you know, is it Iran versus Iraq versus Turkey versus Syria? Uh, and it just seems to be a, a hugely complicated situation which other panelists and other speakers have spoken to. Uh, so from an Iranian perspective, I mean, um, you know, how do we interpret Iran's engagement with the region, uh, accounting for local interests, you know, mm -hmm. the things going on inside of Iran, mm -hmm. and how that might manifest and how it's engaging with Iraq, for example? Well, I think uh, if Iraq was once a priority in terms of security, right now it's an absolute necessity. Iraq is vital, uh, not just for security, but also for its economy, especially in the face of U.S. sanctions. And I think it's uh, difficult to envision Iraq as a... Does it go beyond that, just the U.S. sanctions, if it's vital for Iranian security, or are there other things... I think it's sure? vital for Iran's economy and thus its national security because directly U.S. sanctions, because mm -hmm. it strangles Iran's access to global markets. I think Iraq's role as a potential mediator uh, has been lessened because if you look at the grander scheme of things, at the core, at the bone of the contention between Iran and the U.S., it's about the regional order, and thus you have regional spoilers, right? So Iran has no issues with the Iraqi leadership whatsoever. U.S. has no issues with the Iraqi leadership. In fact, U.S.-Iranian interests completely align in Iraq. There are no differences fundamentally about how things should be run in the long term. I think to deal with these regional spoilers, which are doing utmost anything they can to prevent Iran-U.S. dialogue, I think, Iraq the best it can do right now 
the government of Adel Abdel Mahdi, which it has been doing, is to improve relations with Iraq's neighbors, specifically Gulf Cooperation Council countries. I think Iran supports such initiatives, and I think the best thing that Iraq can do to help aid Iran-US dialogue is to improve relations with GCC countries and to send a message that cooperation with these countries is not aimed at any third party, and that Iran's cooperation with Iraq is not aimed at any third parties either. Then you can promote an, an atmosphere which allows these countries, which are, I think, terrified of Iran-US dialogue and accommodation, to sense less insecurity and, and, and find their own interest in such dialogue in the long term. This is going to take time. It's a long process. It also, is there something that... Oh, please, go ahead. And regarding, you know, you have said that all the politics, if I'm not interrupting your talk, uh, all politics is local. Just it's it's true, you know the, the foreign policy is being shaped by you know the domestic concerns, but it's vice versa. If you look at the Turkish you know perspective on that, you, if the people living in this region, you are seeing that all countries, almost all countries, are in trouble. Okay, from if you look at the issue from Ankara, Turkey was has has having very good relations with its neighbors, rising rocketing trade or something like that, and now there is no you know a border you know trade in in the, in the region, neither in Syria. It is very difficult with Lebanon, neither not, nor in you know the Iraq, but very limited with you know the uh, Kurdistan regional government and Iran because of the sanctions you are not able to do anything and Georgia is just uh, invaded to an extent by Russia and that's why it is creating a psychology that Turkey can be put in such kind of a troubled region and that's why the people are thinking that we should just support the government too much not to be destabilized with such kind of you know, international atmosphere, and it's shaping the domestic you know, psychology as well. Regarding you know, the Iraq's role, as, as Mohammed said very well, Iraq is important not only for political, but for economically, really, because it's a very diverse economy, you know, diverse population, a huge population. It has both people, energy, lands, and that's why it was so important for Turkey. But we should, we should add up one more thing regarding the Kurdish role, not only in the Iraq, but also in sometimes Turkey regarding, you know, the, Mr. Barzani was visiting the Arbakur and it was creating a link, not from country to country, but it was easing the tension among the, you know, the Turkish citizens. And the, the, the Iraq's role is, was role really so important. And lacking of this role is creating a problem for Turkey itself as well. Do you mind if I can jump in? I, so I, started no, I wouldn't off. want any kind of dialogue yeah. here at all, yeah. discussion. So. Um, so I started off by uh, agreeing with Mohammed Swan. I actually want to mostly disagree with another point that you made about uh, the idea, the notion that the United States and, and Iran want the same thing from Iraqi politics and the political leadership. Where I would disagree with you, perhaps over the long term, maybe that that is the case in terms of you know if you define American interests in Iraq very broadly, Iranian interests in Iraq very broadly. But in the near term and the medium term, I actually think that's one of the problems between the U.S. and Iraq sorry, the US and Iran over Iraq, is that the United States and Iran want very different things from the political leadership. As, as you very rightly pointed out, Mohammed, I think you're completely right. Iran benefits from, and I'm gonna use these words you didn't, but a deeply corrupt Iraq, an Iraq that it can manipulate. It is dependent on Iraq economically. It needs it for currency manipulation. It needs it for smuggling. The United States, and again, how much the Trump administration is pushing this is obviously a matter of debate, to say the least. But at least in theory, the Trump administration, and certainly the United States government writ large, would like to see an Iraqi government that is not corrupt, that is more representative of its people. Uh, we believe, Americans believe, that this is the way that you would build a stronger, more stable Iraq. You know, we look at the protests in Baghdad and say, to a certain extent, this was an inevitable product of the corruption, of the log jams in the political system, of its inability to deliver. That's problematic for what the United States wants. And so well, I agree with you, perhaps over the longer term, if you define things broadly, but in the short term, in the medium term, I think that this is one of the very important differences. I don't think that much is going to come of it right now, because again, as you and I both agree, the United States isn't making a huge effort to change the circumstances, which again, I would say is a shame. I think, I think there is uh, something I disagree with you, Ken. Please. Uh, I think uh, the United States doesn't want to see uh, um, uncorrupted uh, 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 
uh, elite in, in, in Iraq or to uh, support the Iraqi uh, people. Yes, those are very important things for the United States, but the priority is to see uh, Iraq away from from the Iranian influence. And the same thing for the Iranian. They, they, they don't want to see Iraq as, as, as you know, uh, within, within the, the uh, um, as, as we used to, uh, to, to, to hear in Iraq, the American, Saudi, Zionist, et cetera, uh, project. This is, this is the way that, that each party is, is, is uh, 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 working for to bring Iraq from, from the other. That why, and the, the problem is that this, this struggle became, a, it, it divided even the Iraqi elite into a party, a side that within the Iranian axis and the other side within the other axis. So this is the problem, which is, you know, it's a kind of mutual influence between the domestic and the uh, 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 external uh, 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 enemies. Yeah, if I can just respond. It, it's an interesting statement, Mohammed. I'm thinking about it. In particular, you know, President Trump has these, these interesting relationships with different autocratic figures around the world. Um, perhaps you are right that if he could get a completely corrupt but completely pro-American government, he might favor that. Um, I'll, I'll save the statement by saying, though, that, again, I just don't think that he thinks enough about Iraq, right? And that's problematic in one light. In this case, perhaps it's good. What I'll also say is that the vast majority of the American government, including most of the people, I think, who work for, for President Trump, that's not what they're looking for. And you remember very well that there were any number of people who, during the course of our occupation, did come to us and say, give me guns, give me money, give me whatever, and I will deliver the United or I will deliver Iraq to the United States. People who right. promise, we will, I will make a treaty with Israel if you will back me to be the new dictator of Iraq. And the United States turned those people down. Right, so, you know, give us a little credit. Uh, I, I hear what you're saying, but you know, we actually do believe that you know, the, the, a non-corrupt Iraq, a stable Iraqi government, a government that is representative of its people, truly would be in the best interest, not just of Iraq, but of us, of the United States too. So in interpreting Russian's policy, right, Moscow's view, and that's what we're doing is interpreting you know, these, these very countries. How do they view this dynamic? You know, that how does Baghdad, uh, deal with this mixture of policies from a Moscow perspective, and what would what would Russia want to get out of this? I guess. Well, actually, I believe that now we have entered a new era, a new epoch, when the global powers, active as they are, cannot really impose any solutions uh, upon the Middle East, and not only Middle East players. What is important right now is the role of regional powers. And actually, you can see how active they are. The question is whether they are only active or responsible as well. Because this is, this is the main issue. We can see what Iran is doing, and we do realize that it has its own legitimate interests in the region. It, it does feel isolated. It does have a headache of, of, of problems, and something should be done about it. We don't like the methods, probably, but we do understand that there are concerns. We do understand there are concerns in Iraq, especially if we look at the, uh, the domestic situation right now. There are concerns of Turkey, but uh, all these powers should also take responsible steps to solve these issues. They can ask for assistance, but no one can do it for them, you know? And this is a very important, I believe, uh, result of the end of the Cold War. So the situation is totally different. And if you take Russian perspective and Russian presence in the region, we do understand that we were very much greeted also because of the fatigue of the United States. And the local countries wanted to have a system of check and balances again. It's not because we are so good, but because we were needed at this very moment. So uh, is it a good sign? Not very good, because it still proves that the regional powers want to 
rely upon foreign assistance and uh, not think much of what they can do themselves. I mean, there is this aspect, right, where a major power comes in, whether to impose their own interests on the region, which never works in the long term, right? Or it can be used as a crutch almost, right? An enabler of irresponsibility or bad behavior because the local authorities or power centers really don't have to take full responsibility for the consequences of their effectiveness or ineffectiveness. You can kind of um, outsource that to Russia or to the United States or France or whomever else, right? Uh, where if they have to stand on their own feet, uh, you own it, right? If you can't solve the problem, you own the consequences and, and suffer whatever those are. But if you solve it, then you gain the benefits of that thing, right? And so this involvement of major powers, uh, you know, Ken, what you were saying about helping to solve or helping to fix, um, I'm a little skeptical that that can happen. I, I think that, that, the, the, that the locals in a particular region or country or township really need to take ownership of their own circumstances. And it's why I was so uh, taken with the comments uh, we heard yesterday about uh, solve your own surroundings first, make life better for your own citizens, and it's amazing how that can kind of spread out as an exemplar for other localities, you know. So it's, uh, I get the involvement to all the external players. Uh, the Middle East is a critical region for global commerce and energy and all these other sorts of things, but uh, perhaps uh, local, you know, power centers should be very careful about how much you introduce or invite in these other actors as well. I mean, perspective perhaps from the <clears throat> from the Turkish perspective? Regarding, you know, the, the, the major powers are coming and just in order to help the regions, uh, the, the major powers, Russians probably in Syria and Americans is probably in, in Iraq, they are able to break the gloss. But before repairing it, they are very, you know, very easy to leave the region. And I do not want to legitimize the, you know, the, especially the previous corrupt regimes in the region. I don't say that, you know, indeed the region is a, a garden of roses, but just the, the, the outsiders are coming and they're just messing it up. Of course, it is not the fact. But just only just uh, trusting, just having a confidence in foreign powers, they will come and cor correct it. It's impossible. And they are not doing this. Of course, very easily, they are just looking at their own interests. And after the fulfilling their interests, they are just going back, especially for the, you know, uh, yes, it's a democratic tradition, by the way, and, and it's a flexibility for the American administration. One American president's first priority is to come and innovate, and the second is just going back without backing to the back. Okay, and then it, it is just, we are living with, yes, we are owning the problem, mm -hmm. but they are, nobody is letting us to solve the problem. That's, I think, an, an important thing. It is a bit simplifying the problem, I know that, but you know, uh, it is not being with the outsiders and without the outsiders. Well, let's, uh, let's open this up to audience participation. Uh, hopefully somebody has a question <laughs> on these very important issues. Uh, in the back, please. I guess we have a microphone. Hello, uh, Vladimir Vilgeberg, Kurdistan 24. I had a question for a Russian analyst. Uh, how does you see the Russian role in Syria? Because there was recently some discussions. Turkey said they wanted to do a new intervention in, uh, in Syria, and Russia said they would not be happy with that. Do you think that Russia would stop Turkey from doing more incursions and like work together with Turkey basically to keep stability? What's your perspective on that? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. You know, uh, uh, the, the relationship with Turkey in Syria um, uh, are very good, really. And there is uh, a real understanding. But at the same time, as you know, uh, Russia was not very happy about Turkish operation, though we realized that there are security concerns which could move Turkey into, into, into Syria. So, but at the same time, we do, we do believe that we all should keep territorial integrity of Syria. It means that Turkey can have only 
a narrow belt on the, on the border to patrol it and to be sure that no one will uh, manage to cross, to cross the border and will create problems and headaches for Turkey. So Russian role was the following. We uh, managed to, 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 of course not alone, but with all participants, to coin up a certain agreement. So now Russia and Turkey uh, forces, Russian police forces, they uh, have been patrolling the, 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 the territory, the, the borderline, and the Kurds uh, who had to leave the area, they um, politically were forced into negotiations with Damascus. And uh, after all, it's, it's a good sign because Russia was very much willing to start such negotiations. We do believe that they should agree on the future of the Kurds in, in Syria and how it will look like. So without Damascus, this issue cannot be solved. So it seemed to me that the, that the Russian pushback against the Turkish uh, plan or desire was really to kind of contain this, right? Let's not allow the problem to get any bigger than what it already is. Is that a fair interpretation? Well, of course, uh, as far as I understand, the plans of Turkey, initial plans were different. So, but thanks to negotiations, they stopped. And it was possible now to have a relatively small area which can be patrolled and which can make the border with Turkey secure. Yes, sir. The gentleman up here in front. We got one, two. I think we need more microphones. Right here. Yes, sir. Thank <laughs> بكل تأكيد شكرا لكل الأساتذة الذين تفضلوا بمقارباتهم التي لامست قراءة للوضع السياسي المتعلق بالقراءة الإقليمي والدولي بحسب فهمي أن هذه المقاربات لم تلامس في الأصل ما يجري في العراق في أزمة عميقة وكبيرة لعل الأولوية أن نقرأ هذه الأزمة وارتدادات هذه الأزمة داخليا وإقليميا ودوليا ومن ثم ننتقل إلى ننتقل إلى ما يمكن أن يكون للعراق من دور لدى أحد الأخوة المداخلين الأساتذة عبر عن الأزمة في العراق قال أن الأزمة لا تعد في بلد صغير في العراق كجزء صغير في المنطقة والعراق ليس جزءا صغيرا بحسب فهمي وبحسب ما يقرأه السياسيون هو ليس جزءا صغيرا كما يعني. لا على مستوى الأزمة ولا على مستوى الفعل ولا على مستوى التاريخ فأبدا لم يكن صغيرا الأستاذ الأمريكي أشار إلى قضية معرف قضية قال من العار على أمريكا أنها, أنها لم تساهم في تغيير أو في مقاربة الأزمة من الأمور التي ينبغي أن نؤشرها أخلاقيا رغم أن البعض يرى أن أنه ليس ليس في السياسة حضور الأخلاق وهذا خطأ كبير طبعا لا ليس للسياسيين وليس للسياسة أنا أتمنى أن نفرق بين بين من يتعاطى السياسة وبين السياسة بوصفها كيا علما إنسانيا رائعا فأنا أسأل ما هي ما هي الآليات الأخلاقية لعبارة كيف نتعاطى وكيف يمكن أن أن نفكك عبارة العار التي وردت في كلام الأستاذ المدرس شكرا لكم Thank you very much for those comments it allows me to expand a little bit because of course I am in full agreement with you um, different people have different perspectives on how countries should make policy and whether it should be on nothing but venal self-interest or whether there should be ethics and humanitarianism as well. 
I'm one of, I think, a number of Americans, many Americans, who would actually argue that the two work well together. That in our own history, that the United States has done best in the world when it actually remained true to its own values. That it is one of the things that many people admire about the United States. And that many of our worst moments on the world stage was when we forgot our own humanity, our own values, our own ethics, and the importance of helping other people in the world. It's one of the reasons, I think it was important, Dakota, that you made the point about, hey, let people solve their own problems. Uh, at some level, I agree with you. And you quoted me correctly. I said, we should help, not we should do it for them. Right? I think one of the great mistakes that the United States made when we invaded Iraq in 2003 was we thought we knew better. And we were going to fix all of Iraq's problems, and we were going to make all of you do it the way that we thought we could, that it should be done. That was a mistake, a huge mistake. I think that there are a lot of Americans who even at the time realized that was a mistake. I think that there are a lot more who now realize that our role should not be telling you how to do it. It should be helping you to do it and encouraging you to do it in ways that we think would be best for you and for us. And human values, humanitarianism, the, the fate of your people, I think is critical. And in the short term, yes, you often pay a price because it's much easier to just go with those in power. Over the long term, I think that that kind of investment in what is it best for the people, what is best for the nation as a whole over the long term, I think that pays off enormously. And again, I think that the United States has done that in certain places around the world. And where we've done that, the payoff has been enormous. I think too often, the United States hasn't done that in the Middle East. That when it comes to the Middle East, we have far too often prioritized short-term power, money, whatever it may be, just take that and walk away. I think that's one of the ways that the United States has contributed to the problems of the Middle East. And I would hope that we've learned our lessons. I would hope we're moving in another direction. But unfortunately, this administration, this president, doesn't seem to be terribly interested. Any other comments among the panelists for this? May I, say, <clears throat> may I say something? You know, actually, probably it will sound not properly here, but you know, I do not believe in uh, value-driven politics. First of all, it should be interest driving because when we apply value, values, and when we are applying them to what we are doing in other regions, you know, sometimes our values are not accepted by those people who are living there. They have their own values. And this probably is sometimes a very bad example if some country wants to do something good and uh, introducing values into its policy. But uh, such values are alien to many to whom they are directed. So, so I, I, speaking for the United States, it can be a real problem in the US where if you truly um, accepted uh, how another country conducts business, that how they do that doesn't align with how we would do it, then internal to the United States, there is a question about why we are supporting another country or another government or people when they may do something that we wouldn't agree with. And so within our own Congress, I mean, I think this is probably true, Ken, it sets up this, uh, this friction inside the dynamic, but I, I completely appreciate it. I think it was, uh, yes, the woman. Hello. Oh, we have to. He Go said ahead. the part two of his question. Part two? Yeah, he said he asked me what for his part two of his question. Uh, there, was the, there was the ethics part. What was the other part there? Possible to repeat? Ethics? Oh, oh. That, that's, yes, sir. So the other part of that then was. Um, it's not a simple issue here in Iraq, right? So the complexity of the problems that I think other panelists have really talked about and some of our keynote speakers have talked about 
of solving the difficulties inside of Iraq so that you can be more of a help uh, in, in a larger regional context. I, I don't know where the role of the United States is in, in terms of solving or helping to solve some of those. I don't know if, if Iran, Iran or Russia or Turkey could be instrumental in helping that, other, and other than to maybe take some of the parties outside of the country and have an off-site uh, conference of some sort. But um, I, I think that Iraq needs to solve its own problems, uh, and not for us to assume that that's going to be a simple matter. Did that? Any other comment on that? Let's go to the second question. Okay. Um, hello. Uh, thank you for the panelists. Uh, actually, uh, we are talking about uh, Iraq, future of Iraq. Is it going to be a battleground or is it going to be a build, uh, bridge builder? If we think about uh, or look at the bigger picture of the area, uh, we see most of those countries around, I mean, the Middle Eastern part, these, uh, the, the countries are suffering from transparency and anti-corruption programs. They don't have no programs for those two things, as well as failed of policies. Most of the policies are failed, broken of rules. So if we think about those two, I mean, all these points here that I'm raising, so I think uh, we need to, um, to look at those two words. Is it a conflict area or a bridge, uh, a bridge builder? And I think we are on a conflict side. So how we can help Iraq to build his future here with your help. Thank you. I think it can actually be both, right? It's a center for conflict as well as you know, seeing that there are opportunities. But if you could address that. Uh, I think Iraq can be a bridge, not a bridge builder. Uh, you know, Iraq geopolitically is in the, in the middle, you know, the Iran in the, in the east, uh, Turkey in the north, and Saudi Arabia, and also the United States everywhere. So uh, Iraq and what, what I, I think that Prime Minister Adil Abdel Mahdi believe in is that uh, Iraq can, by building a network of relations, of especially economic relations, he can, in the first stage, uh, uh, um, ensure its stability, which is a very important uh, stage to go further. Uh, that's why he started with all the you know, uh, agreements with Iran, Saudi Arabia, with, with Egypt, Jordan, Turkey, uh, just to show that Iraq is uh, qualified, is ready to, uh, uh, to be the center of this network of interest. Uh, this is a very good approach to, to, to uh, follow, uh, taking in consider this, this, the current situation of Iraq. But without credibility, though all those agreements, we, we hear from different, all those countries, that Iraq is not serious in uh, achieving those uh, agreements. Yes, we have bureaucracy, we have all uh, the corruption, all those things that prevent uh, 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 the, the government from, from achieving uh, those agreements. So even what Iraq want to, uh, to do, to be this bridge uh, builder uh, faced by the uh, current uh, situation. And regarding the, the, the uh, crisis that uh, His Eminence uh, 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 talked about, uh, yes, we have a crisis now. We have a deep crisis now. But uh, for the long term, uh, we will find that this crisis will produce solutions for the, for the future, will change the, the way that Iraq deals, not just by, by, by uh, its parts, but, but also by, uh, it's dealing with, with the neighboring countries and with the, the world, because there is now a new generation in Iraq, a new generation with different way of thinking that, unfortunately, the current political elite, uh, they, they don't understand how, what this new generation want, what this new generation uh, 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 see, and what they, uh, uh, you know, what they are doing now. They want to change everybody, which is a, a, a very strong uh, message that they they have to to receive. Go here, this gentleman. 
Ambassador, we'll go you next. ماكو صعب عن جزيرة الحقيقة أنا أستغرب يعني لكن للأسف الشديد لم أرى إدانة واضحة لما يجري في ساحات الاعتصام في العراق هناك شباب تقتل في عمر الورود لم نجد إدانة لهذا هناك أربعمائة شهيد سقط في ساحات الاعتصامات عزل يقابلون القوات الأمنية بصدور عارية هناك سبعة عشر ألف جريح ومصاب لم نجد إدانة واضحة هناك أسلحة من المقذوفات المحرمة تقذف على هؤلاء الشباب وهم يطالبون بحقوقهم المشروعة ويطالبون بوطنيتهم وسيادتهم هذا جانب السؤال الثاني نحن لدينا مثل بالعراق يقول الإفعاء لا تموت إلا أن يقطع رأسها والكل يعلم أن هذه الأفعاء هي إيران إيران التي توغلت فسادا بالمنطقة نهبت ثروات العراق قتلت أبناء العراق سلحت ميليشيات تخطف وتقتل باسم الدين وباسم ولاية الفقيه التي يرفضها العراقيين جملة وتفصيلا أنا أقول على المجتمع الدولي الآن أن يتدخل بقوة لإفراغ الساحة العراقية من الوجود الإيراني ولا لا يكون هناك استقرار في المنطقة إذا لم يكن هناك عدم وجود إيراني سواء في العراق أو في سوريا أو في لبنان أو في اليمن وهناك توسع آخر المسألة ليس مسألة سياسة واقتصاد المسألة عقدية بحتة يجب على الجميع أن يفهمها أن ولاية الفقيه تريد التوسع في المنطقة والشعوب العربية الشعوب المسلمة ترفض هذا التوسع إذا بقينا على هذه الحالة سوف يكون هناك دمار في المنطقة ولا يكون هناك أمنا في الشرق الأوسط إذا لم توقف إيران عن هيمنتها على هذه المناطق شكرا Clearly, we're addressing a long, deeply running issue. Um, my experience has been that it's very difficult, short of a military assault, to force your way into a country. There has to be an open door someplace. So I don't think blame can be laid uh, solely on one side or the other. But if we could get some comments, uh, starting with Iraq, and then we'll go to Iranian, and then I think, uh, yeah, everybody. Let me answer uh, his eminence in Arabic. Sayyidina al-Tabi'a la taqbal al-Faraq. Ma dumna du'afa fadaama sayakun hunak man yatadakhal fi shu'unna. Al-Iran ladayha masalih. Wal-Wulayat Muttahda ladayha masalih. Wal-Jami'a yudafi' an masalih. Fal-Rabt al-Mawdu' bil-Janib al-Aqa'idi. Hada mawdu' akhar. Hunak min al-Iraqiyin man yu'min bi wulayat al-Faqiq. Wa hunak min yarfudha. A'taqad هذا الربط غير دقيق هناك مصالح هناك ساحة مشتتة وفارغة دولة تحتاج أن تبنى هذا الذي سيبعد كل التدخلات الخارجية ليس فقط الإيراني الإيراني وغيره الذي يحاول أن يعني يحصل مصالح داخل العراق أم. I agree with the assessment that blaming any one actor for all the ills in one country or the region is not uh, constructive. But beyond that, I have only really one question, uh, kind of a response even. Would we be sitting here without uh, Hashid Shabi and Peshmerga? No, we wouldn't. So they have played a role, they have done a sacrifice, and we should appreciate that sacrifice. Does that give them carte blanche to do whatever they do? No. Of course, there should be rule of law and there should be respect for obligations. And I think Iran's long-term policy, and this is where I think it aligns with the U.S., is to have representative democracy in Iraq, a majoritarian democracy in Iraq, which respects the rights of all of its citizens, an Iraq that is at peace with itself and with its neighbors, all of its neighbors. And I think this is Iran's policy in the long term. 
And I think hopefully, uh, if there is a change in US policy, there can be more progress on this. Because right now, I think with this administration in Washington, they do not have a Iraq policy. Everything is subservient to the grander Iran policy. And for this reason, pursuit of even US interest in Iraq is secondary. If the goal of defeating Iran or putting pressure on Iran supersedes an actual interest in Iraq, the Iraqi interest in Iraq will be deleted. This is the reality of the situation. So for this reason, it's very difficult for Iran to uh, act uh, as constructively as it could. So I think more inclusive dialogue and more engagement with the US, hopefully, and a shift in US policy can help with this. Very good. <clears throat> Did you have Osman? Regarding, regarding condemning you know, the killings uh, in Iraq, you know, it is impossible not to condemn what's happening over there. As Turkey, you know, we have condemned all the killings in the region, starting with the Arab Spring as well. What happened in you know, the Tahrir Sukar, what happened in you know, the Rabia Sukar, and what is happening in Syria right now, and of course what's happening in Baghdad. Nobody is you know, happy with it, and especially if you look at the issue from the Ankara's perspective. And I think this is the continuation of a wave of, way of unsatisfied Shabab, unsatisfied people in the region. And unfortunately, during the Arab Spring, the quote in quote, you have said that there is no value based uh, foreign policy. Unfortunately, the, uh, uh, the, the, the European countries, the democratic countries, the Western countries just missed a very important opportunity during the Arab Spring. But what will happen right now? Regarding the solution, we need to find a solution. A blame game doesn't bring a solution to the region, to both, to, neither to Iraq, nor, nor to Syria, nor to Turkey. What should be done, from my perspective, if you are not bringing the, the, the parties of the, you know, the region, I know that it is not easy. At the outset of the Iraqi war, you know, there was the neighboring countries to Iraq. They were coming together, discussing the problems of the region. It may be evolving to a not Iraqi-focused organization, but a regional-focused organization, discussing about the problems of the region. And, and it should be done. But the problem is that, like amending the constitution is so difficult for Iraq right now, but at the outset, it was easier. Again, bringing all the countries, all the parties, I, I need to be a bit slower for the translation, uh, bringing all the parties, all the countries together is not so easy. But the problem, first of all, the, the, the countries, the parties in the region, including Iran as well, but all the parties come together and try to find a solution. But first of all, Iraqis should find a solution, not to blame some outsiders or not to expect a solution from outsiders. We have just a few minutes left. Ambassador and then the young woman uh, in the back. Thank you. I, I have a question uh, for Dr. Zviagalskaya and uh, also for Dr. Sert, and this comes back actually to the discussion about Russia and Turkey's role in Syria. In the case of uh, Russia, uh, part of the deal that was negotiated after the Turkish assault uh, was w uh, that Russia, with, with the uh, government in Damascus, is that there would be some level of autonomy for Northeast Syria, and I wondered if you had some thoughts as to what level of autonomy we're talking about, what the context would be, and whether that would apply just to the Kurdish areas or more broadly to the area of Northeast Syria. And to Dr. Sert, there's been a lot of discussion about Turkey's security concerns, but so far as I know, there have been no attacks from Northeast Syria, from the Kurdish part of Northeast Syria onto Turkey. But uh, the Russian data says that about 40,000 foreigners transited Turkey to be terrorists with the Islamic State. The US State Department says it was about 2,000 to 2,500 a month. And of course, we know the quality of Turkish, Turkey's intelligence services. They, you know, we saw with the Khashoggi thing, an amazing skill that Turkey has in the intelligence area. So of course, Turkey knew that these people were crossing its territory to be terrorists in Syria. And that raises the question now as to why the United States, where you know relationships with Turkey are a little tense, should credibly believe that Turkey now will detain the ISIS fighters that it itself allowed into Syria. In other words, why should we have confidence in the assurances that uh, President Erdogan gave to Donald Trump? Just a couple of minutes. We've... Okay. Uh, 
Well, uh, to be absolutely frank, uh, I do believe that Mr. Assad was not interested in any autonomy. What's more, he wasn't even interested in having Kurds as a single delegation at the negotiations. You remember it. So what he could speak about was a sort of decentralization. It means it's something short of autonomy, but certain powers should be given to the local authorities, things like that. I don't know what the results of negotiations between Kurds and Assad will be, because they are not over yet. What was important, I believe, when um, we managed to stop the, the, the operation of Turkish forces was that uh, Kurds were physically saved and could have a political say in what's going to be in Syria. I do believe they will be given something, but what kind of compromise they will be able to reach, I cannot predict. Any the question was so comprehensive, and, and that's why I don't know whether to reply in just in two minutes. But I want to say something more regarding you know, the, your uh, arguments that the ISIS militants are penetrating uh, through Turkish borders. More than that, the PKK militants are penetrating to the region through Turkish borders. And does it mean that Turkey is supporting the PKK because it is letting the PKK militants using its own borders? It is not easy to seal the border. And yes, terrorists are using all the borders in the region, including PKK, including the Turkish border. Regarding what's happening in the ISIS, especially at the outset, I have a question mark. You know, there was no ISIS at the outset. There was foreign fighters, I remember very well. And the number was about a few hundreds, not thousands. And uh, Turkey talked to the Americans, look, we need to fight with this, but first with Assad. If you can solve the problem of Assad, there won't be any problem of instability in the region. But rather than, the Americans, uh, first of all, pushed Turkey to stop Assad, and then suddenly pulled back, and their only you know, priority was the terrorists, which is, of course, legitimate. I do not understand, I, I, I do not delegitimize it, but they let you know, the, the instability uh, in the region to continue. Regarding the passage through Turkish border, uh, nobody can deny that any terrorists just passed through the Turkish borders. Just there's a question mark in my mind that maybe at the outset, the Americans were not unhappy to see some foreign fighters to go to Syria to balance some Assad forces, and maybe they are making some cooperation with the Turks. I don't know. This is just a question about it. Regarding fighting with ISIS, especially the Euphrates Shield uh, operation, just, you know, Turkey gave hundreds of marches to fight with ISIS, and ISIS made the biggest attack in the region apart from Syria, in Turkey. And do you think that Turkey is supporting ISIS to make some attacks in Istanbul, in Suruç, and other regions? I don't think so. And finally, regarding just sending back the ISIS militants, at the outset, Turkey was asking the European countries, just give me names to stop ISIS militants to go into Syria. They said that, no, we cannot, because they didn't commit any crime right now. And then at least you should do something for me to, I cannot do this. But look, 30 million tourists are coming to Turkey, and the Europeans are telling to Turkey that stop the militants as if they are seeming like a militant without any notification. How can Turkey do that? And today, more than 4 million refugees living in Turkey. How can you seal the border? Sealing the border, sometimes like what's happening in Kobani, was not something good, because you are leaving the people to their own destiny. If you are opening the border, then you, it is impossible to control 4.5 million refugees coming from the region. It doesn't legitimize what's happening in the region. But please, as just, you know, can say at the outset, please give the credit to Turkey. Thank you. I do want to get to the enthusiastic young woman in the back. <clears throat> Uh, my my question is to Dr. Hidiaska. I'm sorry, you, I, I, I can't. Okay. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> just, uh, if I didn't misunderstand you, uh, you said the primary priority of uh, uh, Russia uh, regarding Syria is the safeguarding the territorial integrity, right? Uh, however, uh, given the legitimate security concerns of Turkey, uh, uh, Russia has constant on Turkey's patrolling uh, through the borderline. However, we know in Efren and Gerablus, 
it is more than patrolling. It's almost annexation. So on one hand, safeguarding the territorial integrity as a principle. On the other hand, you know, just uh, would you please help us, me particularly, to uh, understand this contradiction? And the second part is actually, um, this is very often repeated, uh, uh, the Turkey's legitimate security concerns. Would you please also, from Russian perspective, uh, define exactly what kind of a, a, a threat does the Kurd, uh, or what kind of a threat generates from the Kurds in Syria against Turkey? Thank you very much. Uh, yes, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> better for you. <laughs> so I would like to start with a very simple conclusion. Principles are very good, but they are not always implemented into practice. It's good to have a principle, but at the same time, we have to make compromises when we cannot fully implement these principles. So yes, we do support the integrity, territorial integrity of Syria, and we'll do it in the future. But since the situation is such that, uh, unfortunately, no one can provide, from the Turkish point of view, enough security at the border area for Turkey, something should be done about it. S Turkish concerns should also be taken into consideration. And not just by Russia, because I want to remind you of Adan Agreement, which was long ago, when Syrians recognized that there are problems on the border, and uh, when they concluded an agreement allowing Turkey to take a certain part of the territory of Syria along the borderline. So uh, I'm not going to, to go deep into it. What I want to stress that these concerns, to a certain extent, were shared by the Syrian government itself. And that is why, well, Russia can only confess to what they agree upon. So we are out of time, uh, Mr. Prime Minister. Oh, we're good? Okay. Thank you to the speakers and to the, thank you to the speakers and to the chair. Uh, this concludes our second session for today. Uh, now we have the lunch break. I kindly request you all to be back here at 2, a 2 p.m. sharp because it's late. And also, please leave your translator devices on the table outside so we can recharge them for the next session. Thank you. Thank you.